I will show the movie twice, first uninterrupted, and then I'll pause the video and point out the echo formations. Note how the colors represent the gradient's action. When the gradient is reversed, the colors reverse as well. Here we can observe how, when the spins of the first chemical shift align, an echo is formed. Here the spins of the second chemical shift align. For the purpose of this demonstration, I've made the two peaks different in height. In a real world application, a peak's relative height would be determined solely by the amount of the material in our sample as with conventional 1D Fourier transform spectroscopy. Next, we reverse the gradient. This second negative gradient acts in a similar manner to the first positive gradient, merely mirroring its action, that is, working backwards in a sense. This video illustrates three important points. One is that the gradient focuses and refocuses the spins. Two is that different chemical shifts will refocus at different points in time. Three is that the positive and negative gradients produce signals which are mirror images of each other, following a last in, first out rule. Another defining characteristic of ultrafast NMR this animation makes clear is that the signal a single iteration produces is already proportional to the 1D spectrum of our sample, Fourier transformed along the T1 domain. Had we employed a mixing sequence, we would have observed its effects on the peaks in exactly the same way as if we had Fourier transformed a regular 2D spectrum along the T1 domain. The basic block described in the previous transparency is repeated many times and the signal is recorded. It may seem at first that the positive and negative gradients cancel out each other, and that repeating the basic block will not yield any new information. This is almost true. While the negative gradient refocuses whatever winding the positive gradient has induced, the spin's chemical shift evolution is not refocused and it continues to take place. As a result, the peaks in our acquired signal get modulated by the chemical shifts, as shown figuratively here. This illustrates the basic scheme of ultrafast NMR. First, encode along the z-axis your T1 evolution, and then acquire and observe your T2 evolution by direct measurement. The data acquired must now be processed somehow. Our basic acquisition block has already produced for us a spectrum of our T1 axis without having to apply any Fourier transform. The effect of the T2 evolution modulates the peaks. Thus, by selecting a particular peak, say the first peak in our example, and observing its shape being modulated, the chemical shift effects can be studied. This can be made evident if we rearrange our acquired signal in a 2D acquisition space, where one of the axes corresponds to the Fourier transform T1 axis, and the other to the acquisition time variable T2. This makes the underlying structure of our acquired signal much easier to decipher. All we need to do is to Fourier transform along the T2 axis to obtain our desired 2D spectrum, that is, to make the chemical shifts evolution transparent. We now come to the question of exciting the spins. How can we design an excitation pulse that will assign a different T1 evolution time to each slice? We can view the excitation block of our pulse sequence as a black box, the sole purpose of which, as we have seen when discussing the acquisition, is to produce a phase linear in both position and the chemical shift. Fortunately, there is a way of designing such a black box by using chirped pulses. Chirped pulses sweep their RF frequency through a given spectral range, sequentially affecting the spins within that range. 
Combining gradients and chirped pulses is the key for creating the phase we are after. The actual sequence is shown on the left. Two chirped pulses with alternating gradients, followed by a purge gradient and a hard pulse. Before analyzing the excitation scheme presented here, let us digress for a moment and discuss the effects of a chirped pulse. Here we have a typical 1D spectrum of a sample having three peaks. Each peak corresponds to a different Larmor frequency. When we irradiate the sample, we can tune the RF frequency, omega RF, to each of the three peaks. We can tune it to the second, the third, or the first peak. Whenever we tune it into a particular peak and irradiate, the other peaks will be less affected. This is the concept of resonance. The farther away the peak is, and the longer we irradiate, the less it will be affected by the RF pulse. We illustrate this with an example. In this example, we've tuned the RF field to the middle frequency, omega 2. Let us observe what happens to each of the frequencies as we irradiate the middle frequency in an attempt to excite them. We can see how omega 2 gets excited, but the other two frequencies, omega 1 and omega 3, were not affected. This was because they were too far off resonance, and their natural precession frequencies did not match that of the RF used. We can also use the concept of resonance to sequentially excite the frequencies one by one. Instead of irradiating at a particular frequency, what would happen if we were to vary the RF frequency linearly as a function of time? Such a pulse is called a chirped pulse and its phase is illustrated on the right. Let us observe what happens now to each of the frequencies as we irradiate them with such a chirped pulse. This movie shows that the first frequency matched by the RF pulse, omega 1, gets excited first, followed sequentially by omega 2, and finally omega 3. 